Okay. Um, where were we? Uh, yeah, here. Okay. Okay, so um, uh, we introduced uh, sine and cosine, so those derivatives are very simple. Sine and cosine alternate between themselves as derivative forms. Um, uh, and, uh, and now we can start seeing the significance of the product rule in particular. Uh, we're going to combine polynomial forms with, uh, or power forms in general, with trigonometric functions through multiplication or division. Uh, things get more complicated. Uh, so the product rule is a requirement there. Uh, so we've got sine and cosine, but what about the others? What about uh, the uh, uh, secant, cosecant, tangent, cotangent? What about their derivatives? How can we find those? So let's do that. Let's go ahead and finish the trigonometric functions because of the fact that every other trigonometric function is either a ratio, is either a reciprocal or a ratio of sine and cosine. The others can all be dealt with using the um, quotient rule. So, what's the derivative of tangent? How do I express tangent as a ratio of fundamental functions? So, this is a quotient. That means I can use a quotient rule to find this derivative. Um, so, uh, I'll go ahead uh, to separate my fraction into its components. So, this guy on top, I'm going to call f of x. This guy on bottom, he's going to be my g of x. And in the same fashion, uh, now the derivatives, we've already gone over uh, the derivative of the numerator is uh, cosine. And the derivative of the denominator is minus sine. And so now I'm ready to apply the quotient rule. Let's see, where was that? Quotient rule, way back here. There it is. There's our quotient rule. I've got my f and g identified. Now the only thing I've got to do is plug them into the formula in the right way. Okay, so I'm going to do that right now. So the derivative of y comes from, number one, the derivative of the function from the numerator, which we just showed to be cosine x multiplied by the function in the denominator, which is also cosine x. <coughs> and then from that I'm going to subtract the derivative of the function from the numerator, which is sine x, multiplied by the derivative of the function from the denominator, negative sine x. And then all of this gets put over the square of the original denominator. Um, so, well, yeah, yeah, I guess I need to let's make sure we see what happened here. According to the formula, the quotient comes from f prime times g minus f times g prime. And this guy down here on the bottom, that's the square of f. Okay, now, how does this simplify? Of course, here I've got minus minus, so this becomes plus. And the square of cosine. Okay. Now what? There's our Pythagorean identity. Sum of squares in the numerator is independent of the variable, so 1 over. Cosine squared. And finally, this is a reciprocal form. So, what function, what trigonometric function corresponds to the reciprocal of the cosine function? Secant. Secant squared. There it is. There's a derivative of tangent. Through the quotient rule, I was able to show that the derivative of tangent is the square of the secant function. Um, so this is not quite as simple as that relationship between sine and cosine. Sine and cosine just alternate between them with that adjustment for sine in the case of cosine. But the tangent function is the square of a completely separate function, the secant function. Now, tangent and secant both share the fact that their denominator involves cosine function.
but the derivative of tangent square secant. All right, let's put that aside. Now we've plugged in that hole. We've got sine, cosine, tangent now, and those are the fundamental operators. Uh, okay, what about secant? What's the derivative of the secant function? Well, how do I express secant in terms of sine or cosine? Or, well, <laughs> we already said, right? Secant is the reciprocal of the cosine function. So once again, this is quotient form, so I should be able to solve this problem using the uh, quotient rule again. But this is going to look different uh, now, up on top. 1 becomes our f function, and just like before, g of x is the uh, function from the denominator. What's the derivative of f in this case? 0. And just like before, the derivative of the denominator negative sine x. And now, let's do it again. Uh, the derivative of y is equal to what? Well, um, the derivative of f comes first. The derivative of f is 0. And then I multiply that by g itself. Of course, it doesn't really matter now because the 0 is going to cancel that away. And I subtract f multiplied by the derivative of the denominator. So, and then downstairs in the denominator, just like before, the square of the cosine function. So what happens here? Well, this zero multiplier cancels away the first term. Uh, here, I've got, just like before, minus minus, so those cancel away. And in the end, uh, what remains? Well, on top, I've got sine, and on bottom, I've got cosine squared. So, in terms of sine and cosine, that's the result. Um, but once again, this is a quotient form that involves sine and cosine, so I should be able to write, rewrite this in some way in terms of some of our other reciprocal and ratio identical forms. Um, but I will do one last thing. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, re uh, separate this numerator into its component factors. In fact, I'm going to do this. Uh, I'm going to put one factor of cosine under 1, and then I'll leave the remaining factor under sine. So all I've done is I've taken this original fraction, split it up into two pieces by taking one factor of cosine from the square in front and back. And now finally, what do I see? 1 over cosine is what? Secant. And sine over cosine is? So here's another odd result. The derivative of a secant turns out to be secant function times the tangent function. OK, put that away. Now that we've done that, we know what it is. Okay, so that gives us sine, cosine, tangent, secant. And it shouldn't be hard to see that cotangent and cosecant are going to work out in a similar fashion. The only difference between those two functions is, uh, the only difference between tangent and cotangent is the reciprocal, right? Sine on bottom, cosine on top. And the secant function, the cosecant function has sine on the bottom instead of cosine. Uh, so it's not hard to see that those two are going to work out in pretty much the same way. Uh, let me see, do I have a summary of that somewhere? Yeah, here's a summary of all six derivatives for the trigonometric functions. Here's sine and cosine. We talked about the geometry involved in establishing those relations. Here's tangent and secant. We were just able to prove those using the um, quotient rule. And here are the analogous formulas for cotangent and cosecant. They're the same relation between the two pair, but they're negated. So the tangent has a derivative of secant squared. Cotangent has a derivative of negative secant squared. And secant, secant tangent, cosecant, cosecant, cotangent, negative. Um, and so all these guys pair off, right? All six of these under the derivative process, uh, they all pair off. Sine and cosine are related to one another. Secant and cos uh, tangent and secant are related to one another. Cotangent and cosecant are related to one another. So, um, 
But now we know. There they are. So we're going to add these to our list of derivative laws. We've got the derivative laws for power functions. We've got the derivative laws for all the trigonometric functions now. And I think in the homework, they're going to ask you to do these two. In the homework, I think they want you to do these two in exactly a similar fashion to what we did for sine, uh, tangent, and secant. Okay, so now we can extend this even further. Um, let's see if we can find the first two derivatives. Let's find the first and second derivative of each of these functions. Think for a minute. Yeah. <coughs> okay, so number one, uh, what's the derivative of x times secant x? So we already saw a similar, uh, th you know, this is a product of a power function and a trigonometric function. Uh, we saw a similar example earlier, right? A sine function is a, a x squared sine. That's the same sort of thing. Power function multiplying a trigonometric function. Um, how is this one going to work out? Uh, so once again, I've got to break out my component factors. f of x will be the first factor. g of x will be the second factor. And you know, you've got to recognize now that this does come under, this is an application of the product rule. x times secant x, those are two different functions that are being multiplied together. Um, so if f of x is equal to x, what is the derivative of f equal? And we just did g of x. The derivative of the secant function is secant tangent. Okay, so what's the derivative? According to the rules, the derivative of the first function multiplied by the second is that derivative. And then the derivative of the second function multiplied by the first. Okay? And so what do I have here? Uh, simplifying, I've got secant x in front. And I've got x, secant x, tangent x. Uh, and finally, there's one last thing I'm going to go ahead and do. Uh, and this is very common, in particular, uh, given that I'm about to repeat this process, given that I'm about to do this derivative a second time, I'm going to go ahead and take advantage of the fact that there's a common factor between these two terms, and I'm going to factor. Um, we could have done that earlier. Uh, we could have done that up here. Uh, because these two terms do have a common factor. And if I were going to repeat this process uh, for this expression, I probably would have gone ahead and done that. Uh, but we're definitely going to do it now. Um, what's the common factor here? And if I remove secant x from each term, what do I have left? 1x tangent. Okay, so here's the first derivative. And uh, this is very common uh, in, in particular. As we move forward, this is something you're always going to want to do. Uh, when we look at the sorts of things we're going to do with derivatives and the way they're going to be applied, uh, anytime there's a common factor through the result of the application of the quotient rule or the product rule, we'll always want to go ahead and do the factorization because uh, when we look at the sorts of applications that are going to be involved in this process, uh, that's going to be an essential part of the process. Okay, there's the first derivative. Now let's go back and do it again. What's the second derivative of this function? Okay, so this is going to be a little bit more complicated. I've got a brand new arrangement, so I've got to go back and redefine my factor functions. Secant x represents one factor, and uh, 1 plus uh, x tangent x represents a separate factor. So, once again, I'm going to have to apply the product rule. In fact, in order to determine the derivative of g, I'm going to have to apply the product rule to that factor. So this is going to require a double application of the product rule. Um, in fact, I might need some more space here. <coughs> so let's see what's going to happen here. Uh, we've already got the derivative of f. Uh, I don't even need to write it down again. The derivative of the secant function is secant times tangent. 
Um, but now I can see that I'm going to need this. I'm going to need the derivative of the um, second factor here. And in order to do that, I'm going to have to apply the quotient rule, uh, product rule. Um, the derivative of one, uh, in fact, let me go ahead. I'm going to do this just uh, to make things clear. Uh, what's the derivative of one? Zero. So this term is going to vanish. So that's going to be gone. Now the product rule has to be applied to x times tangent x. So I'm going to have to give this function a name. I'm going to call this u of x. And I have to give this function a name. I'm going to call this v of x. So in order to take the derivative of that expression, I'm going to have to apply the product rule again. So let me see. Let me work that out here. Okay, so how is that going to work? Uh, the derivative of u in this case, we've seen that already. The derivative of u is 1, so there's u prime. The derivative of tangent is uh, something we've already... Uh, no, we don't need the derivative of tangent yet. That's just uh, uh, the second part of the product rule is the original back factor. So that's going to be 1 times tangent x. So there's my uh, v function. And then I'm going to add the original function u multiplied by the derivative of the back factor. So we already showed that was this. And so there's the uh, other side, u v prime. Whew, boy. <coughs> now I'm ready. The second derivative of y is going to be what? Well, I take the derivative of that from function f. The derivative of f is secant tangent. And then I multiply that by the original back factor. So the original back factor of 1 plus x tangent x. So in our new, in our new arrangement, that is f prime and that is the function g. And to this, I'm going to add the original factor in front, which is secant x. And that is now going to multiply the result of the derivative of g, which you just obtained. That looked like this. Tangent x plus x times secant x. And so this is an illustration of the, uh, what we normally see. You don't always see this, but uh, every time I take a derivative, especially through the product rule, <coughs> things start to compound in complexity. So uh, here's the function f, and here's the derivative of g. Uh, this introduces a whole new level of complication to uh, the way this problem is going to work out. Let me see here. Would it be worthwhile to... Uh, Hmm. I don't know. I don't think I, I don't see any real way to put this in a much simpler form. I can expand out here. Yeah, let's go ahead. Let's go ahead and expand all this out and see if we can get some like terms. What's going to happen? Uh, secant x tangent x times one plus secant x tangent x times that other thing. So that's going to give me an x, a secant, and a tangent squared. So all of that comes out of that first term, first pair. Second pair, I get another secant tangent. And then I get all this other stuff. Secant x secant squared. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't think I see anything here that will... Now these two can come together. I actually end up with two of these. But 
But I don't see anything else here that's going to help us to simplify this. So I guess this would be the simplest way to write it. Boy, we're very close to something here, but I don't see it. Now. Nah. I guess that's, that's as far as we can go. And of course, the issue with trigonometric functions is whether I can actually simplify this using our identities. And we do have an identity, an important identity that relates uh, the secant and the tangent function. Uh, that's, our, uh, th that's this one. Square of tangent can always be replaced by 1 plus secant squared. Um, that's what I was looking for. I was looking to see if we had that here, but I don't see it. So I guess we'll stop there. Okay, so uh, here's, uh, you know, uh, things are getting tedious, cumbersome, but that second application of the product rule required third application of the product rule, and that gave us a rather complicated result. Uh, and if I were to do this again, uh, what a mess it would be, having to go through this process a third time, because I've got three products now, things are getting very messy. Okay, let's do the same thing for uh, the next one. What's the first two derivatives of a uh, tangent squared? That's <coughs> oh, right, <sorry>. sine squared. <coughs> so what rule do I need to use for this example? It's got a power, it's gotta be a product. I don't have any rule that covers powers of trig functions. I've got a rule that covers powers of the variable, but I don't have any rules that covers this case. So I'm going to have to rewrite this as a product and apply the product rule directly to this. Um, and so uh, this would be my f function and this would be my g function. They're the same, so uh, the two derivatives are equivalent. f prime and g prime both equal <coughs> same thing. Uh, but, at this point at least, I don't have a rule that covers this case, separate from the product rule and looking at the square as the product of the sine function with itself. So, what is this going to equal? I'm going to work out the details. Uh, the derivative of f goes in front, times the sine function. Then, uh, in back, the same arrangement in the other direction, sine times cosine, and what do I end up with? I end up with this. Hmm. We've seen this before. What is this? What is that? Double angle with a sine function. Just so happens we've already solved that problem. Uh, so here's another, ask, again, uh, those identities really make our jobs a lot simpler. Uh, I right, immediately recognize we've already done this, and as a whole, this whole expression here is simply sine of 2x. So the second derivative is going to come from a result that we already obtained. So if I go back up here to the original sine x cosine x, uh, that's example 3b, we already showed that that was the double angle formula for the cosine function. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and do it this way. Um, this is going to be equal to 2 times the derivative of cosine sine. which we've already done, that is the double angle for the cosine function. So that came from uh, that example. So that was much simpler because uh, just so happened I had already worked out the second part of that. And again, that's an interesting result. 
right? The square of the sine functions, derivative, turns out to be the sine's double angle formula. The second derivative doubles the double angle formula for cosine. So there's that same kind of cycling through those valuations. Okay, so that wasn't so bad. Uh, but again, um, I'm going to go back and look at this. I just, I'm just convinced there's something here that I'm not seeing. But uh, I've got an X. It should be an X there. Okay, uh, so uh, again, product rule is the, uh, we've seen uh, these, all these examples, product rule, quotient rule. Anytime I combine uh, these trigonometric operations through uh, these uh, products and quotients, and some of those trigonometric functions are naturally product, uh, quotient forms, reciprocal forms. So all of those uh, product and quotient rules are essential to fleshing out all those details. Um, okay, and now let's do the usual thing. Let's go back and do the thing that we normally do with derivatives. Uh, information about tangent lines is one of the aspects that comes from uh, derivative forms. So let's go ahead and do that. Uh, what's the equation of the tangent line to uh, this curve? at the point uh, pi zero. So what do I have to do? How do I start? The derivative. Anytime I see a question about a tangent line to a function, I know some point, I'm going to need that function's derivative. So y prime, uh, what's that going to be equal to in this case? Two. two cosine x. That was easy. It's derivative of sine is cosine, so the only the two didn't come into play. It's a constant multiplier. It just sits there. Okay, good. That's it. There's a derivative. What comes next? Yeah. So I've got the point of tangency. So what I want to do now is evaluate this at the point where x is pi. So there's my little um, uh, new uh, indication of sub substitution. So all I've got to do is go into my function, plug in 2 for pi, I mean uh, pi for x. What does that equal? Negative 2. So cosine of pi is negative 1, so the slope of the line is negative 2, good, okay. And now all that's left to do is derive the equation. So uh, once again, I'm going to go ahead and use the point slope form of the line. y minus the y coordinate slope x minus the x coordinate. So over here on the left, there's y minus 2x plus 2 pi. So there's the equation of the tangent line to the graph of 2 sine at the point where it has its, uh, one of the x-intercepts. Okay, this is nothing new, right? We've done that before. In fact, this is a relatively simple case. Any function that is uh, only uh, based on the single trigonometric functions is relatively simple because those derivatives are simple. Um, and here's the other question that we ask ourselves. Where does the graph of the function have horizontal tangent lines? It's an important aspect. Horizontal tangent lines are clues to turning points. Turning points are important graphic features of, of a function. So let's solve that problem. Okay, so how do I start? Derivative. Tangent line, derivative. Tangent line, derivative. Okay, so what is the derivative of this function? And I don't know, just to make it, uh, just to make things uh, clear, the usual thing. Term by term, the derivative can be applied, and anywhere I have a constant multiplier, that gets pulled out. The only place that I actually apply derivatives are to power power function and the trig function. The derivative of x is what? And the derivative of cosine is what? Okay. There's a derivative. Let me 
looking for horizontal tangent lines. So now what do I do? Tangent line is horizontal, has a slope of zero. So what I want to know, where does this happen? Okay, let's solve this equation. Now it's a trigonometric equation. So let's see. First step. Okay, so how do I start? What's the first thing I'm going to do? Subtract 1. So right here, uh, that takes care of that part of it. And uh, then what? So I want to get my sine operator completely isolated. And now, all I've got to do is tell you, tell where all the locations where sine of x is equal to negative one-half. That's all that's left. And of course, I know there's an infinite number of them. Uh, within the first revolution around our unit circle, where do I find the locations where this statement is true? Um, let's see, where? Oh, right here. Okay, well, where's my wheel? Mm. No, that's the wrong class. There it is. Okay, there it is. Okay, first time around the wheel, where do I see sine having a value of negative one-half? There's the first one, 7 pi over 6. But of course, I know it happens again. Where's the second one? The second location where that happens? There. Okay, so those are the two locations within that first rotation around the circle where the condition that sine of x is equal to negative one half is satisfied. How do I produce all the solutions? Any integral multiple of 2 pi added to these two. So this graph has an infinite number of horizontal tangent lines. They occur 7 pi over 6, 11 pi over 6, and all locations in which we add any integral multiple of 2 pi to those. So there's a review of trigonometric equations, solving trigonometric equations, and this is just the simplest case. Um, so uh, we need to know that. Um, anytime I solve one of these equations, I expect an infinite number of solutions because trigonometric functions oscillate through their periods. And so I've got to be able to identify those first two locations within that first revolution where the condition is satisfied. And depending on the form, there could be more. And after that, I have to be able to anticipate where all the other solutions are going to be. So those first two solutions within that first rotation, and then any multiple of 2 pi added to that, that takes care of all the locations on the graph of this function where the horizontal tangent lines occur. And those are potential turning points. Okay, good. Uh, so uh, again, uh, so there's a summary for now. That's all we're going to need for our trigonometric functions. Um, it all starts here. It all starts with our understanding of how sine and cosine uh, had derivatives that relate between, between themselves. Knowing that much allowed us to determine um, uh, the, the derivatives of the tangent and secant function. And we could have done uh, cotangent and cosecant. They're done the same way. 
uh, and then uh, now that product rule becomes much more powerful because when I combine um, our power functions with the trig functions or through quotients or products, uh, those rules are now essential. And then the normal interpretation of what we do with derivatives, uh, use them to analyze properties of tangent lines. And please notice again, in all of these examples, at some point, not all of them, but most of them, refer to some identity that related trigonometric functions. So that's why this sheet here on the identities is so important. Uh, simplest forms all involve being able to identify the appropriate identity that relates uh, the particular result. So all that stuff from trig and then solving the equations, all that stuff from trigonometry now becomes part of what we're going to be responsible for uh, when we're operating with the trig functions in the in the calculus. Okay.